These companies, they recruit and etc. The corporates and the government are on the tail end. But for some strange reason, we have left the destiny of our own countries in the hands of politicians who are only here for five years and they disappear some other times, three years. And first year, they're in office, they're still trying to guess where the front door is and where the left door is, where their offices are. The second year, they're trying to put together a team of people that can work. On the third year, they start tendering for the programs and designing programs. On the fourth year, they're planning elections and uh, they're not taking any new products because they won't be here next year. On the fifth year, they are campaigning, and on the sixth year, they are asking for the second term. And this has been going on and on from the, for the past 60 years, from Kwame Nkrumah uh, in, in Ghana to South Africa. And sometimes, it's very president walk into power, before they even finish their terms, they're being chased away. People are already tired. Also, some strange reason, the African child thinks that democracy is a mysterious, profitable business that is coming from the West only to produce coconuts out of us who are brown on the outside and white on the inside. The purpose of this, con of this conversation is to begin to say, can we champion a development talk that makes us relevant where we are, where the African student is not only learning academic work, but is also introducing himself to the resources that are available in his own country. So by the time you graduate, you're not looking for a job but you are impl implementing what you have learned. I'll make it simpler for the younger viewers. Before you go to university, before you go to college, don't waste your time to go there if you don't have a proposal of the problem that is found in the community. So point number one is not to apply for a place of, of education. Point number one is to take off your shoes and walk the streets of your own villages, of your own townships, of your own cities. Do your own interviews. Table desktop studies. Find out what are the problems in Lusaka. What are the problems in Dola? What are the problems in Kitwe? What are the problems nationally, provincially, and etc.? And study these problems thoroughly well. And then say to yourself, I have an interest in solving this problem. It is found here. It's happening like this and like this. Then go to school and apply for a place of work. Employ all the lecturers to help you to solve your problems. Your assignments, your assignments are further researches into that problem. Meet up with other students to network around your problem. Visit up financial institutions who can fund your problems. If it need be, have your cooperatives that are all united on the same problem. Maybe someone can market, the other one can do accounting, the other one can do HR, the other one can do civil engineering, whatever it is. Group yourselves together as students. By the time you graduate four years later, five years later, you can actually walk up to the funders in the government department, youth development funds. This is where I wish I could be talking to your presidents and your ministers. And when they come in that fashion, they deserve your money. Because they have thought through. They have worked on it. They have researched on it. They are clear on it. The only bridge that is needed very often will just be the money to get them started in terms of their business. Network these businesses. Employ yourselves. The most stupid document any student can write is I hereby. <laughs> oh, it sounds familiar, huh? And when I was running some HR work in some of the organizations, the most offensive thing is to go through the files of the employees reading their application letters for employment. Because they write lies there. I work under pressure. I'm a team player. I, what, is, what, what are the lies do you, like, you write in there? I'm innovative. And, yeah, innovative and stuff like that. But the time they get to work, uh, you find that they, they, are, they are very far from what they wrote on paper. Farmers of thought were saying it's not only about you going to school and studying and learning. It's more than just learning. While you are going through school, allow school to go through you. What does that mean, therefore? Study and learn but have the discipline of learning how to learn. Learning how to learn. By so doing, you are able to convert your education not into a CV, but convert it into employment for yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, the workplace is the most stupid place you can be. People will decide your value. I'll tell you why 
I'll tell you why. I'm sorry, I'm going to offend you. I'll tell you why fools go to work. They go to work because they cannot employ themselves. Because the same job they are doing for another person, they can't do it for themselves. And when they do it for themselves, they don't have the discipline that they find at work. So the work environment creates the discipline. I want you here at 8. And I will knock you off at 10 or at 4. And someone will faithfully woke up to work every morning. Complain on their way to work. Complain at work. Complain on their way back home. And have depression over a job. If you don't like a job, hell no, just quit. Because what are you doing there? It's prostitution of time. You're selling your... Come on, let's be frank. What are you doing at work? You're selling your time. Ask me why you're selling it. Because you don't know the value of your time. Because if you knew what you have in yourself and how you can convert that into your own industry, you don't need to go to another boss and ask them what to do. Not all of us can be entrepreneurs. Let me correct that. Because of the systems we're coming from. But not all of us like working for anybody. There is something that is buried inside every one of us that tells you, no, I can do this by myself. Yes. So first things first, the estate of the mind, what quality of seed. And in farmers of thought, we have taken the model of farming into a model of thinking. So as you are farming the physical ground, we also want to look at the principles of farming and convert them into the mental space. So your mind is the first piece of land that you have. It is a private property estate. No illegal landlords are allowed in this space. No illegal seeds are allowed in this space. Because this is private property. And you cannot have residence in my property. Then who stays in your property? So we can listen to each other, but ultimately be accountable and take responsibility over your own life. The face is not for cosmetic use. You are employed not because of your beauty, but because of the content between your ears. So when the face is beautiful and the software is not working, hardware suffers. <laughs> At a more philosophical level, when a country is beautiful, like Zambia, but the human resource, the brain work, is not working, the resources, they suffer. So every time you see trucks driving out of Zambia carrying copper, your jobs are going your industries are going, your factories are going, and here you are busy complaining of poverty, and yet wealth is driving past your house every day. And you go to school never to study what is in those trucks, where are they going, and what are they doing with our things? Had we been frank on a correct form of education, we would actually block and stop those trucks and say no more trucks live here until you've made products out of these raw materials. Oh, yeah. The principle is he who plants in your field has permission to harvest from it. Yes. So when you give someone permission to plant in it, they come back and harvest from it. This is where men of the church people get offended. Because I gave them permission at one time to plant in my farm. <laughs> now they come to me and say, but a pastor can't do this. And Fundisi can't do this. And I say, How do, what do you say? What do you mean? For the who? For the why? So because we, are, we taught you to do this, oh, so you taught me. And because you taught me, now you are holding me accountable to what you taught me. Have you ever bothered to worry as to what I think, or you want me to regurgitate what you've told me? Mm. And everyone gets offended, because I'm becoming ungovernable. But I'm not becoming ungovernable on your estate, for crying out loud. I'm in my space. So you walk back to your own farm and own the faculties of your own thinking. Sweep the corridors of your own thinking. Sharpen the apertures of your own thoughts. And no one is coming to develop your mind unless you do it for yourself. Oh, yes. It's totally illegal to have a weave on your head worth 4,500 and you are reading a newspaper with two, two, two kwacha feet. <laughs> it's something fundamentally wrong. Because the external furniture can never be more expensive than the internal furniture. And many of us are now majoring on the external veneer instead of the internal faculties. 
Therefore, life is not about external issues. Life is about the estate of the mind, number one. Number two, the estate of reproduction. The estate of reproduction speaks of posterity, continuity. Do not start businesses that die with you, like it's witchcraft. You know those people that start business in the rural areas? Hey, so say the supermarket here, buses is what? The day he dies, the business dies with him. The children can't even pick up the business. We only know that the future is safe when parents are planting trees that they know their children will eat from. Not them, but their children. Now you know that there's investment in long-term projects. So this whole five-year pro program, five-year program that the government is running on does not work at all, does not cut it. It has taken us 400 years to swim in this colonization project. We will not come out of it in five-year development plan. We needed to start having 100-year plans. 200-year plans. 300-year plan. But while I'm saying that, many of the Christians are saying, we will be long gone. Stop daydreaming. We will still be here. Even Peter, who walked with Jesus, thought he would be gone also. Oh Lord, Lord, how long will it be? How long will it be? And Jesus says, not all of you will see death before you see the Son of Man coming. Did he come? We're still hanging around here and it looks like we're going to be here for quite some time. But since I'm a theologian, I'll make it easier for you. There's a technical delay on the other side. <laughs> you, you, saw, you saw us before we started here. You, the function was supposed to start at 2 o'clock, wasn't it? Yes. It was a, a technical delay. Our main musician was still doing some final touch-ups yes. on his sound. So maybe the, the old man and the big man upstairs they are still doing some final touch-ups yeah. on the program. The question is, while they are doing touch-ups, what are we going to be spending our time doing here on earth? And those of you who love preaching, or confuse you a little bit. The other day I heard that he, he, he is waiting for us there. Then the other day I also heard we are waiting for him here. I wonder who is going to the other. <laughs> But before you think that I am throwing mud on your faces for religious purposes, the very same author of the book says, Occupy till I come. Yeah. Come on. Amen. What must we do? Occupy till I come. Make use of the land. Occupy till I come. And before you get interested in anything else, as a seasoned and a circumcised theologian, I'll take you back to where it matters the most. The most important verse you've ever read in the Bible Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. Let's make men in our own image. Let him be fruitful and multiply and fill up the earth and have dominion. Now, this for me is not a religious statement. This is a political statement. Let them, number one, have identity. Every African child must have identity. Who are you? No, I am Musonda. So if I remove Musonda, who are you? No, I am male. So if I cut the piece of furniture, who are you? <laughs> there, there must be another way of defining ourselves. Rather than defining ourselves with surnames, with totems, or male, or female. Who are you? And then Genesis says, in the image. Okay. Come on. Yes. So the first identity is divine identity. Oh, someone say, hallelujah. The first identity, you need to just understand that I'm a divine being. It does not matter whether you are a traditionalist, you are a Christian, you are Catholic, Episcopal, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. Let's not start dealing with the essence of being. Who are you? I am divine. divine. How do you know that you are divine? Because when he was making me in my image, he did not pull off his ears and put them here. Pull off his hands and put them here. Pull off his hair and plant it on my chin. No, he picked up the ground, mixed it with water and breathed into it. And that became a human being. What do you mean, Bishop? Because it means that there's something that is in the soil that is in God. There's something that is in water that is in God. There's something that is in the air that is in God. And when these three things come together, divinity becomes humanity. Oh, yes. Mm. 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 So when we are asking for land, we're not asking for anything except that which we are made out of. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Serious. Makes sense? Yeah. I'm not looking for anything that is out there. I'm looking for that which is married to, me. to who I am. 
Therefore, me and the land are one. That's why we also say in African philosophy, the African does not own his land. His land owns him. From it he came. To it he shall return. Therefore, land to us is as sacred as our women are. And I wish our men would fight more for land than fighting for women. <laughs> That's why I always say in every lecture I speak to Africans, every man must have two wives. Let the women say amen out there. Let the women say amen out there. Because one woman is not enough. I'm seeing and looking at the husband saying, are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. Please, what happens, what happens in BW remains where? Yeah. Remains in BW. Don't ask him at home. If, if, are, are you serious there? The first woman is land. First woman is land. Then the next one is the one you're making children with. So for women, don't marry the man. Marry the land. Then your children will have an inheritance. So don't make your wife pregnant before your land is pregnant. Your children will be hungry for a very long time. So when a man says to you, I love you, I love you as a lady, don't get carried away. Don't say, why do you love me? Stupid question. The right question must be, where do you love me? Because even love needs a physical address. Hello, sir. You can't love a woman on Facebook, can you? No. You can't love you on Instagram and on Twitter no. and on WhatsApp. No. You need an address. Then uh, flesh touches flesh. Is that not so, madam? Let's meet in the corner of Kaunda and it's an address. So if you don't have an address, it's illegal to reproduce. So reproduction for me speaks of posterity. Are you thinking post you as to what will happen after you? Ladies and gentlemen, don't become these nonsensical ancestors. When they die, they want the sheep, they want the goat and the cow, and they never left a dog or a chicken. So, prepare for departure. That's why I love chemistic knowledge systems, where a pharaoh was born and lived to build his grave. Huh? Oh, for you Christians, you think this is off? This is true. Was there no Joseph of Arimathea? Where were going to throw? Where were they going to throw away that gentleman? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was another organized man in the community who was ready for his exit, even had his grief prepared. When he heard that there's someone who has died on a tree, he goes to Pilate and says, please give him to me. You can borrow my grief, please go and That's being organized. That's not being sadistic. That's being organized. So get organized. Don't be a nuisance on your funeral. Hey, we're here by collecting an offering. Brother so and so is passed away. Can you put five five kwacha each? Five kwacha each for his funeral. What were you doing all along? <laughs> Think beyond yourself. The first estate is the estate of the mind. The next estate is the estate of reproduction. On another day, I'll come and clarify that the war of this world is nowhere else. The war is on our women and on reproduction. The war of resources is questioned on reproduction. If the Africans continue to reproduce at the rate at which they are reproducing, are we all going to be able to access those resources when we need them in the West? No. Let's take the family planning. Yes. Reduce the population. Mm -hmm. For the who? For the women. So that we have less yes. and we can have more. Yes. Because if they become more, we will have less. So the whole program of Family planning does not come at an advantage of how many children can you have. Right. But it comes in a, at a program of how much will Europe make out of you when you have one child each. Oh. So women can suffer with obesity, with bleeding, with all the side effects of... As if our grandmothers did not know how to make us control birth controls. Then I met another woman the other day, very uneducated. <laughs> I'll qualify why she... She looks at another woman bending on a bus, and beads came out on her back. And she goes, witchcraft. <laughs> then I looked at her and said, let me educate you, young lady. In the olden days, when a young lady started her periods, they put the red bead here. Yeah. Second day, third day, fourth day, sixth day. On the seventh day, she's starting to slow down. On the eighth day, they put the orange one, and seven. Then she starts being fertile. 
no, she's, she's now clean. Then they put the white ones. Then now she's ovulating. They put the green ones, etc. And the woman was actually able to look at her menstrual cycle and know when to sleep with her men and when not to sleep with her men. But she knew exactly the anatomy yes. of her own son. Yes. Yes. But that's the one. You come around with this Christian obsession of swallowing tablets. And you look at ancient systems, what we call IKS, indigenous knowledge systems, and you look at these things with disdain, as if swallowing tablets is holier than, than what our ancient fathers used to do. If you don't know what the meaning of this culture mean, sometimes just shut up. Just shut up and keep quiet. Ask other people who know better, what does this mean? Not maybe what Jeremiah was trying to say. Go back to the old ways. Ask the old people who are standing on the crossroads. What? Do these things mean? They will tell you and you gain wisdom for yourselves. Yes. But you say we don't want the old past. We want the new things. As a result, I have rejected you. Hey, go and read it. I have not said it. When you ignore your past, you're heading for serious rejection. Because there's some notes that our forefathers received from the superior source. When you undermine that, God is not coming for a revision. Reproduction. What are we producing? What is living after us? No. Number three, it is the estate of the land. The physical land now that is underneath your feet. And we always say, when you come to that land, you cannot give a man the land underneath his feet if he does not own the land between his ears and control the land between his legs. One more time. You can't give a man land underneath his feet, which is the physical land. If he is not in control, or if she is not in control of the, brain. Of the land, between the years. and the land, between the legs. because if you do that, the land underneath the feet will be vandalized. Agriculture, for example, people are planting poisonous plants, putting fertilizers and destroying the land, because the technology that they are using is not their own technology. They are using foreign technology. So we need Africans who can start owning their own estate. I'm done in the introduction. Is that fine? <laughs> that is Farmers of Thought. You will find it on your Facebook page, Farmers of Thought Maponga J. Follow carefully. Lots of literature I've put there for the past 10 to 12, 14 years. Articles and articles. Please go there and torture yourself. Torture yourself. Some stuff will shock you. Some stuff will make you stop going to church, then you'll go back the following week, some stuff, but you'll be okay. You'll be okay. <laughs> then let's move over to this other critical issue of how colonization happened. I want to share with you just four elements of how to destroy a society. I'll run this program almost like a mafia, so that it sounds terrible, and the impact will be quite resounding. When you want to destroy a community, Number one, level number one, kill their kings. What must you do? So you destroy the center which holds. And after you have killed their kings, change their formats of business. Remove all means of production from them and create your own shops, your own restaurants, your own forms of business. So that the very community of disenfranchised can now depend on you. Are you following? I want to colonize someone. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to starve them. And cut them off from sustainability. So don't plant indigenous crops. They give us small yields. Let's plant these GMOs. And you plant your GMOs when you harvest them. You can't replant them again. You must go back to the white men and buy seeds. Mm. Then you must go and buy pesticides. Then you must go and buy fertilizers. Mm. The day they stop giving you seeds, you are all going to starve. And you starve not only once, even your land has become non-productive. Mm. Our forefathers were alive, ladies and gentlemen. They did not find a bunch of Africans sitting under a tree waiting to exhale. They found a nation vibrant and strong, dancing and beating drums, running a hundred kilometers across, sharing cattle and doing their weddings and etc. because we're eating and we're living long. For those of you who are educated, if civilization is measured in longevity, how come we're living shorter and we're more educated? Mm. 
Mm. Our grandfathers were less educated and more primitive. How come they lived longer? Mm. Yeah, you say you're smart. Go to the United Nations. Go. The issue of living long than our forefathers is actually dependent on the information that you're testing. Shall we all be upstanding as we walk on the guest of honor? We are still continuing with Dr. Mabonga. Let's just have a break. We see to it that the guest of honor is in, and at the right time, we continue. Thank you, guest of honor. Shall we all take our seats? Yeah, so we are back to listen to you. Where was I? You were saying that the people that our forefathers lived longer, yet they were primitive, and yet us that claim to be civilized and not living as When you go to the United Nations and go to these big meetings outside the world, they welcome our guest of honor. When you get out there and they talk about development and development and sustainability, this word always comes up, you know, lifespan, longevity, what other word do they use, by the way? Mortality, mortality rates, all this stuff. My grandfather lived past 100, past 100. All his children died below 60, below 50. My, my, my mother, Guest. we were together yesterday, we were having, my mother, we were together yesterday, we were having a memorial service for my wife. With where you didn't come yourself, you are supposed to have <laughs> My mother is 102 years old, oh, but man. she walks and she, she has more teeth in the mouth than myself. <laughs> Put your hands together for that one. Man. And to, make it, to bring it closer home, we are not talking about sciences that are in the clouds. We are talking about practical examples, which can be researched on. She's lived up to one or two years. What is her genetic makeup? What is she eating? What are her sleeping habits? What kind of water is she drinking? What kind of bed is she sleeping on? What kind of stress levels is she dealing with? What extends this life? Here we are busy buzzing in town, only to go and meet the undertaker before we even reach the age of 20. The question, where are we hurrying to? What's the rush all about? So when we study longevity, we are actually recommended to you as Africans that maybe we have left some solutions in the past in our excitement with the future that we don't know. So we always say, look backwards in the future. Like a man sitting on a boat, he's looking at, at where he's coming from. But the boat is moving to where he is going. Because as long as you are fixated and you are focused and know exactly where you are coming from, you can be sure exactly as to where you are going. So you destroy the economy, you destroy the people, you then out of their misery. In these other cases, you can even create war to destabilize the environment. Destroy the schools, burn the bridges, burn the hospitals, create chaos. And after you've created chaos, level number one, then set up your businesses which they are going to depend on. So the first crime you do when you want to destroy a community is to destroy their businesses and set up your own businesses. Then level two, use your money from business to buy the politicians. Because all politics is money. Without money, you can't do politics. But politics are strategic because they are perishables and, and uh, disposables. They can be bought and they can be sold. And after you've bought the politicians, they are critical. Because you need them for one reason. You need them to vote legislations that will protect your business. So politicians go to parliament to go and protect those that they put them in power. So you want to know who your ruler will be in any country? It is the one who sponsors the elections. He's the one who controls the rhythm of the governance of that country. So who, who runs the country? Money runs the country. The rest is making noise. <laughs> those that are critical are those that are holding the press. And politicians help them to stay in power. Level three, 
The politicians then appoint legislative framework. The, the attorney generals. <laughs> who now come at level three. At the bottom, you have business people who are making the money. Second level, politicians who are protecting the ones at the bottom and appointing those who are running the laws. And in some certain cases, they may even have the privilege of writing the laws. And I want to throw a big challenge to my honorable attorney general, very big one, that before you go to meet your forefathers, we need to start seeing indigenous governance systems taking center stage of our legislative framework. It's critical. We cannot be run by the Roman Dutch law. Then give us Roman Dutch passports. Once and for all. Then we can go to Rome and we can go to Deutschland because their law is actually governing where we are staying. So there's no reason. And the first article in law is, is domicile. So if you say it's Roman Dutch, the question is where is the address? where the Romans and the Dutch are found. And yet this becomes the basis of our constitutions, which is actually European. So our politicians have become inheritors of the colonial system. And we wonder when we put and exchange hyenas with foxes, why are the sheep always disappearing? Don't threaten me, sit down. Raise your finger if you want me to say I'm, something. I'm, I'm not threatening. If you want me to I, stop. I want, I want someone to sit closer to me. And after that, we do media and propaganda. That's where he belongs, walking all, all over the space, and uh, media and propaganda. And on that level also, that's where sports and entertainment and religion belongs. Sorry to say that. I know some of you are taking it personally. It's part of the propaganda machinery. Because had, had, had the Chinese been here, you all have been Buddhists here. Had the Indians been here, you will all have been Hare Krishnas here. Had the Muslims been here, like they were in Kenya, it will have been inshallah, inshallah. We will all have been Muslims here. But because Christianity came with the British, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Come on, be friendly in your thinking. Say our country was colonized by, by British. The religion of the British has now become our religion. It's not okay, by the way. It's not to get offended. That, that's exactly what it is. Because in, 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 in Mombasa, in Egypt and in Libya, they are Muslims. So when a Libyan person says, I'm, I'm Muslim, he's not saying I'm Muslim. He's actually saying we were colonized by the Muslims. Because if you go back to the Libyans before the Muslims came, you may just find a different type of a person there. So let's stop holding this thing with, with golden gloves and we're afraid of looking the devil in the eye and say maybe in as much as this Christianity gives us some advantage and some comfort, but the intention of the religion was not altogether religious, but colonial. Mercenaries and missionaries slept in the same bed. Mercenaries and missionaries slept in the same bed to be in this mess that we are in right now. <laughs> religion has become a pimp on the liberation of our, its own people. Because you cannot fight a white man because he looks like Jesus. <laughs> and when I started this argument, people thought I'd lost my mind. It removed this white guy. For some strange reason, I saw white people doing horrible things in my country. I was still a young boy. I was traumatized. Horrible things. Tying our young boys with wires. 